Good afternoon. I'd like to call the February 9th, 2021 School Board Budget Work Session to order. First, we have a presentation on differentiated support from Dr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, happy School Board Appreciation uh, Month in what is likely the 47th year of COVID-19 and uh, your uh, tenure. Uh, we're happy to be here today to talk about uh, nothing new, but rather a couple of ideas that you have heard about before. Uh, one idea in particular that has been in practice uh, for the past year, and another idea that we have tried very diligently to get off the ground, but does need some financial support. Both are budget initiatives in the superintendent's proposed budget for fiscal 22. Before we dive in, we've got a pretty important question to ask, and this is gonna be a little bit less conventional than some of the presentations that you've had before, and hopefully an opportunity for us to recenter in what we are about as a school district. And the truth is we get to perform magic. Uh, we get to take a group of kids like this, and presto, alakazam, we get to turn them into this. And that's a pretty important function that we serve. Uh, as Dr. Doherty is fond of saying, and as we all know in our hearts, the teaching profession is the most important profession because it is the root of all professions. And nothing is more true than how we support our teachers in the classroom and, uh, and the things that we do to support our principals who lead our schools. So we're going to revisit our values tonight, and today we're going to focus on two values in particular. We're going to focus on equity and ingenuity, clever ways to solve complex problems so that we can provide greater equity of opportunity and greater equity of success throughout our school division. So there is an important part of equity that we don't spend an awful lot of time talking about, but probably should. And it's this stuff, and that's why this is a budget presentation. But before we get to this, and before we tackle all of that, we wanna talk about what we know that actually works in improving schools. And none of this should look like a surprise. It actually should look an awful lot like common sense. And we're gonna see some of this show, showcase today. And the first one is no surprise to a lot of the folks uh, who are watching uh, at home today or who, have, who are a part of our school system, they know that great teachers improve schools. Our board members who have been teachers know that great teachers improve schools. As a matter of fact, it is the single most important thing that you need to have in order to improve a school is great teachers. The second most important thing that you need is great principals and great school leaders. After that, a focus on student and community needs uh, using uh, uh, continuous improvement techniques and a growth mindset, and then, of course, differentiating our resources to the areas that need them most. And it's that last little bullet that we're going to spend an awful lot of time focusing on because we already know that we have great teachers. We already know that we have great principals. We already use improvement science to leverage our strengths. It's that differentiation of resources that makes a big difference. And so... The big question says, well, how do you know that that stuff works? Well, we have proof, and we have proof in Chesterfield. As a matter of fact, instead of seeing this picture for the 47th time uh, during budget season this year, you actually get to hear directly from the person in the middle of that picture who led the transformative change at Ettrick Elementary School, the fabulous and uh, awesome uh, Dr. Randy Smith. You'll hear from her at the end of this presentation, and she'll tell you, uh, what we already know to be true is that when you make an investment in kids and teachers and you differentiate that investment, great results can happen. Uh, it's a proud moment for all the po folks that were in that picture and for the countless others that weren't uh, who helped support that effort. So how do we make that happen? Well, it goes down to giving kids what they need, and that is at the root of how we define equity in Chesterfield County Public Schools. And so maybe it's not just a huge stack of cash. Maybe it's that we bend that stack of cash to focus our energies where we know it matters most. Not just to add dollars indiscriminately, but very focused dollars to where we know it will have the greatest return on investment. 
So all schools are different. We know this to be the case because all kids are different. So why do they always get the same stuff? Well, they shouldn't. And so this past year, we've made some changes to how we uh, allocate resources in Chesterfield. And what we're seeking this year is an enhancement to that initiative that's well underway. So Etrick's keys to uh, their success are pretty poignant. They had a great staff, phenomenal school leadership. Uh, they used improvement science. They had some administrative support from central office, which changed from how we normally support schools. They had some staff augmentation that was fluid and flexible. Uh, they used different people in different ways. They had a different formula for how their staff was based. And they also had accountability to support the decisions that they made. And I, will, I am proud to say that not only have they realized success, but they've, had, they've realized the success and they've been able to sustain it. Very important. All right, so now it's story time. And I don't know about you, but I love popcorn. And if you are an educator, you have to love popcorn because that is the smell that permeates from every uh, teacher's lounge or side cafe in every school. Uh, it comes from every microwave. Just when you open the door, you can even smell that popcorn has been cooked in that uh, within the past 24 hours, or else it's not a public school. It's a very important part of uh, the culture that we have in public education. But popcorn also provides us with a great analogy for uh, our kids and our schools. Because popcorn starts off as seeds, and I may be dating myself a little bit here, but I used to cook popcorn in a Jiffy Pop on the stove and have the nice big Jiffy Pop get big and uh, uh, it'd be wrapped in foil and then all of a sudden it would, uh, it would burst and you'd get some popcorn out and the excitement from that would be exciting. But popcorn is cooked in oil and once heat is applied to uh, that oil and the seeds are, uh, reach a, an internal temperature uh, that makes them pop, they explode and they become and fulfill what they were intended to do, which is to become Except we know something interesting about this. Not all popcorn pops the same way, even though that popcorn is prepared in the same pot or bag, in the same heat, with the same oil, yet not all of the kernels pop the same way. So what this tells us about our kids and our schools is really important. It tells us that we can't look at everything through the same lens and that not every school is going to need the same stuff. But it also tells us that we need to invest. And if there is something that matters and we see an area of weakness, we need to look at that or else we can't expect changes, at least not the changes that we want to see. So how do we scale up success like what we saw at Etric? Well, we have a recipe for that too. And a lot of this are things that we've been doing for quite some time. Uh, the fabulous Dr. Tinkani White would tell uh, the success that we've had implementing improvement science over the last four years, how we have taken our pools of uh, additional staffing and how we have differentiated those to meet uh, needs of schools in a very surgical way, uh, how we have taken small amounts of funds and how we have applied those to schools where we thought that they could use them best, and how we've created internal controls to manage those on a larger scale. Where we are looking to the future, and you see one little piece indented, is how we might be able to financially support our schools and put our principals in the driver's seat for making decisions uh, that are not encapsulated uh, in a dollar figure that was an allocation from 20 years ago. So there's a couple of different ways that we've looked at data in the past and how we have managed um, our decision making. And there's one school of thought that data can either be a hammer and another school of thought that it can be a flashlight. And in the past, admittedly, Chesterfield County has taken the uh, vantage point that data can be the hammer. We used to group schools and color code them red, yellow, green, and if you were a red school, by God, that meant something bad. It meant that you were not doing what you needed to do. It was the hammer. Well, now we still categorize our schools as red, yellow, green, 
but it's viewed a different way. It's through the lens of a flashlight, where it exposes some of the challenges that we need to address. And now being a red school has a totally different connotation uh, overall. And so part of this is part of our effort to uh, provide multi-tiered systems of support. Over 80% uh, of our schools would fall into a category of what we would call tier one schools. Uh, and 20% of our schools would fall into that tier two schools. Fortunately for us, uh, we have no schools really in the tier three category. And how do we classify these schools? How do we come up with these tiers? Well, we use data to help uh, drive that decision and where we came up with. We came up with a system called CASES. And uh, CASES uh, stands for Chesterfield Adverse School Elements and Supports. And if that sounds anything like ACEs from Trauma-Informed Care, you're heading in the right direction, and we're glad that you're heading there with us. We have three categories of data that we have collected, academic performance, risk performance, and environmental factors that influence the performance of a school. And so we take these data points and we try to leverage them into a point system where if you are uh, below the mean in English language performance, you get a point. If you are below the mean in English language growth, you get a point. If your dropout rate at the high school level is above the mean, you get a point. And I know what you might be thinking, oh my gosh, if I start accumulating all these points, that must be terrible. But it's not, because the more points that you have, the more support you get. And if we've got a school that's coasting on the cusp, we've got some secondary factors that also help us in our decision making. Things like accreditation, science performance, the number of students enrolled in world language programs, which is an interesting indicator. The number of students who are completing CTE programs in our secondary schools. Um, the substitute fill rate of a school, the employee churn rate of a school. All of these factors are critically important to tell us if a school needs extra help. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to be in a red tier because a red tier might mean that you get the support that you need to be successful. So if you earn 10 points uh, or you were denied accreditation by the Virginia Department of Education, or a level three accreditation as they would call it today, um, we would put you in a tier three category and I'll explain what that means in a second. Um, if you uh, eight or, had eight or nine points as a school, you'd be accredited uh, with conditions or tier or level two accreditation. Uh, that's what you would land in level two and everything else, which is the vast majority of our schools who are performing very well, you will be a tier one school. Now that's not to say that tier one schools don't need support, they do. They need lots of support. And as a matter of fact, uh, part of our uh, budget ask is so that we can support not just our Tier 2 and our Tier 3 schools, but also find ways that we can support our Tier 1 schools in the future. These are not replacements of existing positions or existing funds, but rather an augmentation and ways that we can surgically attack the challenges that they're facing. So why focus on uh, more than test scores? Well, we know for a fact that um, it's more than test scores that make a difference in uh, the whole child's education. And uh, you have seen this many, many times before, and you'll see this many, many times after if we have anything to do with it. It's because we focus on Maslow's hierarchy of needs so that we can attack Bloom ta Bloom's taxonomy. And that's a critical part of our recipe here. So what does it look like if you are um, responding to need at the tier one level? Uh, th this uh, means that you're on a three-year school improvement cycle. Uh, you're following what we call a school improvement and innovation plan. Uh, and your uh, plan is on a three-year renewable cycle. Uh, we differentiate financial support to the extent that we can based on your environmental factors. That's part of our second big ask. Uh, and that you have the base uh, staffing plus uh, targeted areas that, uh, that require assistance. And that would be based on our budget ask for this year. Uh, if you are a tier two school, you are on a one year annual improvement cycle. And we're reviewing with you uh, ways that we can help you improve. You may also need some surgical assistance in some areas like special education, English as a second language. 
made it need additional counselor support because you have um, a, an uptick in your critical incidents at your school. You may need additional administrators in your school or perhaps additional instructional assistance based on the needs of your school. And of course, if you're a tier three school, you're also on an annual school improvement plan. Uh, we are looking very hard at how your school is structured and ways that we can augment your staff so that we can give kids exactly what they need in the classroom and so that we can support you. Uh, just a couple of years ago, we had a tier three school, high performing school, but it was still a tier three school. Henning Elementary School, it's one of the best schools in Chesterfield County, but it was a tier three school based on the data and uh, needed some additional support. And so this is one of the ways that we can provide additional support to our elementary schools. So. What we have is really two big changes that we want to bring before the board. One is to tout the success of a differentiated staffing model, and we'll talk through a couple of uh, examples of what this might look like even in further detail. And the second one, differentiating school finances at the building level. So what staffing used to look like? Um, we used to have very narrow staffing standards that were based on the standards of quality. And uh, if we're looking for a fun uh, name for the standards of quality, we could call them the standards of lack of quality uh, because they promoted nothing that looked like quality uh, at a ratios of 35 to one in the classroom. And I'll show you what that looks like at the state level. Uh, there were uh, regrettably uh, some political processes in place to beg for additional staffing. And if you were uh, a, an apt principal who could beg for staffing, you got additional staffing, not what the data said, but how well you could convince the superintendent and staff uh, to get what you wanted. That's not the way to do things. That's not the way to lead. And so this process is different. It wasn't very transparent. It was very confusing. Uh, it, uh, we never shared uh, uh, the staffing from one school with another school. Now every school gets to see everybody's staffing. It's a big difference. Everything was very conservative in its allocation. Uh, we, we use conservative projections and we uh, staff conservatively. Now, admittedly, we still do that. Um, we still have the taxpayer to look after and we will continue to do so. But that's where we, we started from. Um, and this is what uh, folks could expect. We did have a, a little bit in terms of an extra pool that could be uh, attached to a group of uh, students or to a target area but it wasn't very, much very many positions and it wasn't very much money on an annual basis. So now that we've uh, uh, instituted a new system, uh, this is the first full year of staffing in this manner. Um, we have taken out the political process. Uh, we have staffed things directly based on ratios and based on uh, needs per the data. Now I will say this, you wouldn't be a good principal unless you had uh, a need for another person in your building. Every good principal should be asking for as many people to support kids in their building as humanly possible. And we have fiscal realities and finite resources. So we take with the best that we have and we allocate that as best we can, uh, being as generous as we can on the forefront. Um, we look very hard at performance, risk factors, and environmental factors in making those decisions using the data metrics that we laid out for you before. So here's an example of what we were looking at. And this should look very familiar because this is what we showed the board last year. Uh, matter of fact, much of the information that you've seen already is what we've showed the board last year. And you see what the standards of quality look like um, for Virginia, and that's in that second column there. And uh, as an example, uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia thinks it's okay to have 35 students per class in grades four through five. Well, Chesterfield County doesn't think that that's right. Um, and granted, these are division average numbers, not individual classrooms. So you may have a classroom or two that goes above this, but the division average for Chesterfield County is within the 25 to one staffing ratio. Uh, core support, um, adding additional staff to support uh, uh, specials for our kids. We now have a full complement of specials for our students where kids can go to resource five days a week, where uh, every school has the option of STEAM or a world language class. That's, that's not uh, been uh, what's been historically in place in Chesterfield County. Uh, so that's a big jump. Um, a really big success point for us. 
uh, was uh, when the state made an adjustment and an augmentation to the ESL staffing. Uh, we've had a growing number of English language learners in Chesterfield County. Uh, they add uh, to the rich tapestry of our student body. And um, recently, uh, in the past year, the state reduced that ratio from 58 to 1 uh, to uh, 50 to 1. And uh, we were making inroads into that. We were at one point, we were at 48 to 1, but our staffing standards still said 58 to 1 because that's what, the, uh, that's what the ratio called for at the state level. Well, we made a pretty significant jump last year, and this is something that the board can be very proud of in its last budget. Uh, we reduced and differentiated our approach to staffing based on the level of our ESL kids. And so um, our students who were at level one or level two, that, that's relative newcomers to uh, Chesterfield County and to, to the English language, they were staffed at a ratio of 25 to 1. And for our students that were uh, receiving less support in levels 3 and 4, they were staffed at a ratio of 1 to 40. This is the perfect example of how we differentiate instruction and differentiate support uh, so that our kids get precisely what they need. Um, as you can also see, um, that there's not a whole lot of great support for special education, in particular special education assistance. The reason for this is that the state believes that this is a federal program and that should be supported with federal money, not state money. Uh, so beyond the general education allocation and some guidelines, these aren't even really hard SOQs, there isn't a whole lot more to go on, but we do follow those guidelines and we differentiate accordingly providing additional support for our students with disabilities, our group that needs it most. This is such an important idea that the state has even endorsed this idea because they know it to be true as well. Uh, they see this as part of their budget uh, every year where they do what's called a K-3 class size reduction initiative. And we are the beneficiaries of this to the tune of around $7 million in additional state revenue to offset the cost of additional staffing because they know that children who live in high poverty areas and are in schools that have high poverty need additional supports. So if you have a, a school that is economically disadvantaged with 75% or more of the student population, they believe that your uh, K through three class size should be 14 to one. And they provide the financial support to go along with that and there's a sliding scale. So this is not a new idea. This isn't something that we created or that we invented, but it is something that we know works. And so that's why we pursue it. So some examples of some of the supports that we've been able to provide in the past year. Uh, for our tier two middle schools, we reduced the ratio from uh, 25 to one to 24 to one. Now that doesn't sound like a huge deal but when you've got over a thousand kids in a middle school, it adds up. And it means that you're able to offer that extra elective class. It means that you're able to offer uh, that extra section of a class to make uh, the algebra classes a little bit smaller and a little bit more palatable. It means that you're able to offer that extra section of support for a group of kids that might need it. It's a pretty big deal. A second dean of students and a literacy specialist. It's pretty strong. At the high school level, um, this might mean uh, some additional support in tutoring. It might mean an additional dean of students. It might mean uh, the reduction in your general ed uh, uh, ratios. Big difference. And so the second big uh, request that, uh, that we bring before the board is also one that's not new and, and one that we've all been excited about in the past is to answer the question, how might we serve our students best by differentiating the resources that the principal receives in order to support programs that serve our children best? Admittedly, this is a big weak spot for Chesterfield County because the base allocation at a roughly $53, $54 per student hasn't changed in the past 20 years. We made a slight increase to the base to level it out last year at $54 a student, which was not really significant, um, but that's about it. Uh, we were not able to land this in the budget like we wanted to last year. 
Uh, this is uh, something that sits at the top of your enhancements uh, request in the superintendent's budget proposal. Uh, I don't need to spend the time going through this chart as you have seen it numerous times before, but effectively what we are trying to accomplish is trying to account for some of those environmental risk factors that our schools are experiencing and trying to financially augment their bottom line so that they can provide services in addition to what they are already providing for these kids. So what this means is that every school realizes the benefit of updating the base allocation, and every school would also realize an additional benefit uh, to help augment support for students who need it most. So the ask. And here's where it comes down to dollars and cents. Um, we are asking for differentiated financial support for our schools. And we would like to program this in over the next five years in your five-year plan, accounting for inflation, adding for additional growth, and doing a 3% increase every year after the base year that this gets implemented. The second big ask is to add additional positions, small at a time, uh, and, and add each year additional positions to a pool of positions that can be allocated to schools based on their data needs. And so at this time, um, you've heard enough from me, as you normally do, <laughs> and uh, it's better to hear straight from uh, the, the field and to hear what um, our educators in the field have to say. And so uh, at this time, I'd like to invite four of uh, our principal colleagues up uh, to, to talk to you a little bit about their experiences and how they might use differentiated resources in their school and what some of their requests might be. As promised, the first person on um, our list this evening to come up will be the great Dr. Randy Smith, uh, followed uh, by uh, Dr. Anthony McLaurin, who is the principal at Carver Middle School followed by Brian Campos, uh, who is the principal at Thelma Crenshaw Elementary School. And we're going to close out this evening uh, with none other than Dr. Chris Jones, uh, the principal at Thomas Dale High School. And so if you all could uh, come up one by one, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Good evening, Dr. Doherty, members of the board. It's very nice to see you all, and happy School Board Appreciation Month. Um, I'm excited to be here because, you know, they asked me to talk about Ettrick, and talking about Ettrick and relaying Ettrick's story is probably my favorite thing to talk about because it's an amazing story. Um, and it kind of goes back a little bit before um, when I was there, but I'm sure you all know that for many years, um, Ettrick struggled with reaching full accreditation. Um, for several years, it was partially accredited, and then um, in 2016-17, it was denied. Um, and that's when um, we had a great conversation about what can we do differently, because while we were a Title I school and we had some Title I funding, we were still trying to fit the mold and do everything the same that all of the other Title I schools and some of the non-Title I schools in Chesterfield were doing. We had very similar resources, and we were maxing them out. Um, in a regular traditional school, I'm glad Dr. Taylor talked about that pyramid because that same pyramid applies when you're talking about intervention. And we were what, what I called an inverted pyramid where all of our, in a traditional pyramid, your base, where most of your students are, they can access level one instruction, tier one instruction, and you have very few at the top who need that intensive support. We were the exact opposite. Most of our students most of our students were coming in significantly below in their reading levels. We were the inverted pyramid where we had very few kids who were accessing Tier 1, and we needed to write that, and we needed help to do it. Um, so we were very fortunate and received um, differentiated staffing and funding for that staffing. And, and what we did, um, we, we were allocated three additional teachers, full-time, highly qualified teachers. We used one to lower PTR in our upper grades, um, and then we used the other two very creatively, and we had them going in to um, provide intervention 
during resource classes of, at that time, STEAM and library, because those two at that particular time were not receiving grades on the report card. So they, the kids would circle in during resource, those two resources, and receive intervention. We used our data to show, predict. We knew that the kids were going to struggle in particular units that were coming up. So we would use those teachers to front load information so that the kids would kind of learn and get that foundational information before they ever reached the actual topic so that when they got to the topic, they had it and they felt confident going in and were able to receive the instruction. Then when we would break out into small groups, we could provide more intensive remediation, but we had front loaded the information with those two additional teachers during resource time. When those teachers were not in a resource, because we used them for second, third, fourth, and fifth grade, when they weren't in a resource, then they would circle in and become um, small group instructors during guided reading and our math um, small group time. Uh, um, we also had funding for three additional instructional assistants for the general ed population. We already had three. We added three more. Our instructional assistants are not clerical people. They do not spend time making copies. They do not spend time um, creating bulletin boards, all of that kind of stuff. Our instructional assistants are in the classrooms. They have to be highly qualified because they're at a Title I school. So we had three more. By ha adding three more, we were able to purposefully put an instructional aid at each grade level instead of having to spread them out thinly. Um, that allowed them time to meet with teachers during planning period and find out exactly what they needed to target during small group. Then when they were in small group, they could rotate just that grade level and really hit the needs, one-on-one -on -one needs and small group needs of our students. Um, it allowed every student to receive focused small group support. We were also allocated um, a coordinator of assessment and remediation, a CAR, because we depended upon real-time data. We needed to know that week what were the strengths and weaknesses of the kids before they entered particular units so that we could provide appropriate front-loaded information, and we needed to know what remediation was needed to help fill in the gaps. We also allocated money for a TWA, part-time tutor for our accelerated math group. For 10 years, Ettrick did not have an accelerated math class in fourth or fifth grade. That meant we were not sending students to the middle school able to access honors level math classes. And you know the, how that progresses when they go on into high school. Well, that wasn't acceptable. We had to create our own criteria of how we identified these kids to get them into an accelerated class, but we knew by being creative there were gonna be gaps. So we needed a tutor in that class to do small groups. You can't really use your Title I funding for at risk, I mean, unless the kids are at risk. So we needed that TWA tutor to come in and help push our accelerated kids. Um, that very first year, 100% of our accelerated students passed both fifth grade and fourth grade SOLs. Um, fast forward, um, that first year of implementing all of these things, we were fully accredited. And then the very next year, we were recognized as a nationally distinguished Title I school for closing achievement gaps. So every bit of that differentiated staffing and funding, every bit of it worked. Since then, each year, one of those positions has been taken away um, because of funding. It's not there. We have none of that left now, none of that. So we are nervous as we go into this next year where we know our kids are losing a little bit of um, instruction and they're losing ground because of the pandemic, which everybody is, I understand that, but we're nervous because we don't have that same support. We desperately need that support back. We can't be treated like everybody else. We differentiate for students, no matter which environment you're in, whether um, or which end of the county, we have to differentiate for kids. Um, so we should differentiate for schools as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you to the board, uh, Dr. Doherty, Dr. Taylor, uh, for giving me a few minutes to just describe uh, differentiated staffing and the impact at Carver Middle School. According to Needham and Snyder, uh, differentiated staffing means changing the role of school personnel 
in such a way that the resulting organization is capable of adapting the program to a given school to the needs of a given child. It means being more resourceful to use the educational personnel. It suggests being more fluid in the use of space, time, and resources. In layman's terms, schools don't operate according to a one-size-fits-all approach. We, have, we educate over 60,000 students in Chesterfield County Public Schools, each with their very own specific needs. At Carver Middle School, we would benefit greatly from an additional full-time counselor. Because everyone is spread thin at the moment, our, uh, we have a counselor, three counselors, and one that we share with central office on a part-time basis. Uh, we'd also benefit greatly from an additional literacy coach um, amongst other positions within the school building. Our students are in a very formative year of their formative years of their development in middle school and are dealing with a public health crisis of which none of us uh, have dealt with within our lifetimes. Uh, Post-pandemic baggage uh, will be substantial, all right? And we need the appropriate staff in place to make sure that our students are able to unpack. So, thank you. Good afternoon, school board. I'm Brian Campos. I'm the principal of Thelma Crenshaw Elementary School, and it's an honor to stand before you today. Um, last week, you guys got to hear from a group of principals talking about teacher pay. Very passionate, important issue. Um, today, it's differentiated staffing and differentiated funding. It's an important issue to me, and it's one that I have been able to see in action as principal of Crenshaw over the last few years. No two schools and no two grade levels within a school are the same. Addressing the specific needs of a particular class requires analysis and flexibility to determine the particular needs. This is where differentiated, differentiated staffing plays an important part in allowing for organizational flexibility. During the, school year the, during the school year, we began to see the benefits of differentiated staffing as well in the form of class size reduction. Last spring, when I was allocated my teaching staff, and after some conversations, I was able to assign an extra teacher to one group of students that has historically demonstrated greater needs. When this great group of students joined us in kindergarten, they demonstrated some needs academically in kindergarten. We worked with them and they started making progress on into the next grade level, continue to make progress, and then the pandemic hit. Um, this is a group that we identified as being needing extra assistance. This year, sliding an extra teacher to support them in their next year, we've been able to keep those class sizes a little bit lower, which has, in this crazy year, allowed us additional flexibility to manage the ins and outs and the class switches that are coming, as well as allow teachers the flexibility of meeting the individual students' needs within their small groups as they have scheduled them virtually, and now that we are back face-to-face, face-to-face. These smaller class sizes have allowed these teachers to address the students' needs to help their progress continue to move forward. Expanded dif expanding differentiated staffing will grant schools additional flexibility to address identified student needs. Differentiated funding is another way to level the playing field and address some funding inequities ac across schools. During my time at Crenshaw, I've been able to see the impact of this and can speak to it as Crenshaw transitioned from just a school with, with a higher percentage of socioeconomic need that was not Title I to a Title I school. As we made to that, that transition, I began to see what that differentiated funding could look like on the school side. For us, we use a majority of our Title I monies towards staffing to provide that additional remediation support. Any remaining funds I've put towards what I see as the core to student success moving forward, and that is literacy, trying to get books in hands. It's really begun to allow me to scratch the surface of purchasing these resources for our students. Um, we've begun to replace our aging leveled libraries. We've begun to start the process of updating our school whole library. For many of our students coming to Crenshaw, we are their public library. Currently, as it sits at the last report that we pulled, the average publication date of our nonfiction collection is 2004. The average publication date for biographies is 2002. And the average publication date for our fiction collection is 2008. 
while you always tell kids not to judge a book by the cover, a well-worn book um, that may not adequately represent the population of the school um, is not always the most attractive way to hook a kid on reading. And as we tried to build inquiry and independent learning amongst our students, literacy is going to be the key way that we move them forward. Having this differentiated funding will allow me as a principal to really hit that, hit leveled libraries, hit classroom libraries, and hit our school library to make it something that our students really want to go to, really want to check out books, so that we can build literate students who are able to not just not just be successful, but to push the boundaries of success onto that next level. Combination of differentiated staffing and differentiated funding will grant schools autonomy to identify and address individual needs of their schools to help make students successful moving forward. Thank you for your time, guys. For some reason, my suits don't fit the same in the winter. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the school board, Dr. Doherty and Dr. Taylor, it is an honor to be selected to stand before you here today. I do not at all envy the position that you're in, and I have a tremendous level of respect for what you're doing right now, especially in a day when everyone has a platform and everyone knows how to do your job better than you. Thank you for your efforts to put the division's money in the right places, salary decompression to just begin to pay our teachers more even though it'll never be what they're truly worth, and differentiated staffing and differentiated support for schools. Putting the school division's money in the hands of teachers and schools, yes. My name is Chris and I'm a humble servant to Chesterfield County Public Schools. I was absolutely blown away when Tim Bullis messaged me asking me to be a part of this today and I'm honored to stand in the presence of my colleagues who spoke before me today. I look to them as the example of leadership on a daily basis, so thank you for allowing me to serve with you. I am gonna read from a script because sometimes my fire, passion, and love for Thomasdale High School send me down some rabbit holes and keep me off task, so I wanna make sure I stay on task. Every school has challenges. None of us are immune to difficult situations to overcome. We are all, every single one of us, fiercely committed to creating a better tomorrow. Let me say that one more time because that is a heavy promise for our kids, creating a better tomorrow. Because each school enters into that vision in a different place, we need things different, differentiated staffing, differentiated funding. It's all critical to the function and purpose of a school. For us at Thomas Dale, we have unique challenges. We have 2,400 students on two campuses. We need staffing and funding that exceeds the basic formulas. We have 326 Spanish-speaking families, yet no translator. We have 310 students with disabilities spread across two campuses and only one coordinator of special education. Her sole function is compliance, making it difficult to lead instruction and close achievement gaps. We have one testing coordinator for 2,400 students who take countless tests in two buildings over the course of the year. We have demands for mental health and social emotional support, and yet are limited to seven and a half counselors. Yes, there is such a thing as half a counselor. Just wait, it gets better. By standards, we should have 11 counselors. We only have half a psychologist and half a school social worker for 2,400 students, 960 of which are classified as economically disadvantaged. By recommended standards, Thomas Dale should have two of each, which is eight times what we currently have. Thomas Dale graduates 600 students a year. Let me say that one more time. Thomas Dale prepares 600 young adults to walk across the stage and to do great things once they graduate. About 350 to 400 of them will go on to a two or four year college or university. Yet we don't have a dedicated college entrance prep coach. To the other 200 to 250 students need workplace preparation, yet we don't have a work-based learning coach. We have fought tooth and nail to get our on-time graduation rate to 95% and to reduce our dropout rate to under 5%. We've done it all without a graduation coach. To be clear, 5% at Thomas Dale is 30 students. 
to support our delivery on the promise of every night, every day. You knew that I was going to weave that in at some point today. We need high-quality, differentiated professional development and experiences that allow each member of Team Thomas Dale to develop our capacity for, per to, for personalized learning. We need unique programs and currently absent facilities that allow us to link curriculum and learning to the 17 career clusters. We need to create our learning spaces so that they look and feel more like what they will encounter in college and the workforce. To be a flagship school for a large division and the Commonwealth of Virginia is not easy, and we are doing it with basic formula allocation. We need more, we need different. Our kids deserve more and deserve different. The real estate boom in Chester can largely be attributed to the success and the high quality of the Bermuda 10 schools. Imagine what we could do if we were appropriately staffed and funded. Again, I am both honored and humbled to be here today. No one else asked for questions, but I'm going to. I welcome any questions you have. Board members, anyone have any questions? Um, thank you for that. Um, it was very moving, and it's it's why we're here. Um, I'm curious because I I get a lot of emails from some schools uh, about parents that have hired tutors um, or who have uh, sent their kid to private school this year, and they'll be back next year. And I'm so excited to have them back. Um, but I think every time I get an email like that, I I can't help um, what next year will look like when we have the kids that come back that have no learning loss and the kids that have had a parent working from home, um, but no learning support whatsoever. Because let's be honest, you really can't work um, when a wiggly kid is, is next to you. So uh, as I think about that, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, you know, this is not talking about differentiated funding last year, which I think was a very different conversation Nice, but maybe we could make it work without it. But I sense an urgency because of COVID, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. I think that's a great point because as difficult as we think this year has been to make sure that we're maintaining the high quality of, of, of teaching and learning that we promise to our schools or to our students in our community, it will, be, um, it will be two to three times as hard for the next three to five years uh, to, to be able to maintain that high quality and to, to ensure that, that, um, that our students who have a different level of access um, can, can still get that, that education. And so th I, I do think for us, because we're, we're chasing it down right now, the first semester just ended, and it's the volume. It's the volume versus the load that we're able to handle. And uh, as the volume and the need increase, so to do, do the hands and hearts um, that, that are needed. So it, it does come down to a, a little bit as well, differentiated staffing. So, um, yeah, thank you for being here. Uh, and so as um, Brian Campos mentioned, you know, that this is going to give his school flexibility, right? This gives, provides flexibility for you to, to create programming. Um, I guess my question would be, what would be your top three priorities for a differentiated staffing and uh, differentiated funding? Because you, you mentioned you're, a social wor you're half a social worker. Um, for 900 economically disadvantaged students, um, and that, <laughs> that looks like about one, one whole social worker for 1,800 kids. So where would you, what would be your top three for both school allocated funding and uh, differentiated staffing? I think on the funding side, um, to, to support the programs that we put in place, to, to support all of the students at Thomas Dale, um, it, but particularly in our work and our effort to attach to the 17 career clusters, uh, we want to be able to outfit a, um, a manufacturing and construction tech lab. We want to be able to outfit a, a kitchen for our culinary arts program. We can't do that without differentiated funding. Um, and we're getting tremendous help and tremendous support from central office. Uh, but those are some of the areas that I would put uh, some of the funding to. For the staffing, I, I think you, you, you heard my immediate needs. I, I need a translator and I need more help with, with, mental, with, with mental health. Um, I, I, from, our, from the budget that I'm allocated, I spend a couple hundred dollars every single month 
on a translation, translation program called Language Line. And that, you know, the, the teacher calls up, there's an interpreter, it's a third person. Um, it, 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 it's a little bit more cumbersome and, and money is going to that uh, from, from the budget already. So be between, between being able to communicate with all of our families, not just some or not just most, but all of our families and supporting the, the ever growing mental health crisis that we're facing, I, I, I simply can't do it with seven and a half counselors, a half psychologist and a, and a half social worker. And, you know, and Dr. Taylor said, like every principal worth his or her salt is going to fight for as much as he possibly can, he or she possibly can, given the constraints. I recognize that, that what, what I feel we truly need it might not be possible because I'm not the only school in Chesterfield County Public Schools, so I, I recognize that. I hope, did I answer your question? Okay, I was trying to talk in circles enough because I was like, why did I ask for questions? I'm just kidding. I have a question. Board members? <laughs> I just have a, as a Thomasdale alum and formal knight, always a knight, I suppose, um, and a teacher, I always viewed the, I would, we refer to them as activity funds or things when teachers would go to you to beg, I need this for my classroom, I need that for my classroom. It breaks my heart to see teachers' wish list, Amazon wish lists being posted on social media and things like that. So I'm curious as to how much um, teacher input would you value in going into how some of these funding funds are spent? Because I would love the day when teachers are not out there in social media begging for money to provide supplies for their classrooms. And I have a couple more. The library at Crenshaw, I mean, the, the thing that the, those types of things, this county is too wealthy to have a library with an average age of their books at 2000, 2004, and, and, and that just breaks my heart. The same with the teachers out there begging for money to support their needs. And I've made this statement multiple times. My husband said we saved money when I retired because I stopped spending all of our his money on my students. Um, so, yeah, I would just like to hear a little bit about how you're going to get some teacher input and, and be able to help them with their needs. That's a great question, uh, Ms. Bailey. We, so the first thing that I do is I put it in the hands of our department chairs um, before I even start plucking away. What do you need? Here's what you've spent over the past three years. Put in what you need. And over the past two years of me doing that, um, this is you know, my third year at Thomas Dale. In the past two years, I've been able to, to allocate exactly what the department chairs have asked for. This past year, I've also allocated um, money from our funds to do 10 teacher innovation grants, and then to also put aside some money for what teachers are doing that is uh, what we would consider innovative um, and, and, and unique for kids. So the teachers are the first ones to get their hands on it, and then I, I get the scraps uh, to, to, you know, for function. Um, so a, as we go, um, we're spending less and less on the things that we, we don't need to spend money on, like paper and toner, uh, and more and more on, on what we do need to, to put the put the money in the hands of the teachers so they could put the materials in the hands of the kids. Last but not least, uh, before Mr. Harder goes, um, I just wanted to say thank you to all the principals for coming this evening and um, sharing your passion and sharing the needs of your schools. Um, it is definitely uh, resonating, and um, I just really appreciate it. And I, too, a night always. <laughs> Well, Ms. Coker kind of stole my thunder because yeah. everyone already asked the questions, but uh, I just want to also give a heartfelt thank you to all of our principals out there that are even watching at all of our schools. Um, you know, you guys represent very well uh, a, a portion of our schools, but this is really something that crosses all of our schools throughout the county. So we do know that differentiated funding is something that, that is needed to increase that allocation and put that money in the schools to allow the building leaders and the teachers to direct that in a way that can benefit the children the most. So thank you guys all very much for, for coming and advocating on their behalf. Dr. Taylor, I have some questions. Please. <laughs> I'm going to jump in there. Um, so, um, so if you could just, I'm going to go down my list here. How, so how does differentiated staffing work in conjunction with differenti differentiated school allocations? 
think we kind of, as, as we went through this, we kind of learned a little bit more about this, but is there any situation where these are standalone? Absolutely. They are two separate items in the superintendent's proposed budget. Um, we'll take uh, differentiated school funding first. Uh, it is a $3 million ask uh, that is in your budget, and that is a variable amount, so we could adjust that as uh, the board sees fit. Uh, but it is our hope that we establish new baseline and we add to it over time and that we create something iterative. It's also important to note that this is high uh, return on investment funds that land in the classroom and land in the principal, and it's less than 1% of your budget. It's a pretty significant impact for a small expenditure in the budget. Uh, as much as you all have gone through budget meetings over the, the past uh, 12 months, uh, 13 months, it seems like uh, most of your tenure has been consumed by three budget processes, this one and then two of them last year, uh, thanks to COVID. Uh, you have seen what this looks like and how tight we are in terms of our expenditures normally. But uh, this, this uh, is a unique request because it is something that goes very purposefully back to the schools. Now, I know for a fact that our teachers are, are very good stewards of the dollars that they have. Uh, and, and the reason that this goes directly to the school and to the school principal and not directly to individual classrooms is because the principal uh, knows and understands uh, the, the vision for the school, the needs of the school and the aggregate, and may be able to strategically align to one initiative, two initiatives, three initiatives, where the impact could be most significant. As to differentiated staffing, uh, that is half of the request of differentiated funding and also something that we would look at doing iteratively. We are, we are well aware of the fiscal realities. Uh, to Ms. Bailey's point of we are too wealthy of a community to not be able to support this is absolutely right. As a matter of fact, the state agrees with you. They have a local wealth metric called the Local Composite Index. We are wealthy enough to be able to support public education better. We don't. And so uh, this is one of those things that is commonplace in many other school districts because they recognize the value of supporting different needs at different schools. And so it's incumbent on us to be good stewards of those money and to invest in areas where we know we get a high rate of return. So the request for differentiated staffing is only 21 positions. And next year, another 21 positions. And the year after that, another 21 positions. Because we're not trying to staff universally giving every school one position or else we'd be asking for 65 positions every year. But rather, this is surgery, not napalm. We're not trying to apply a, a general fix to everything. We're trying to very pinpoint and very targetedly address the things that we know uh, are the most important right now. Uh, Mr. Jones, or excuse me, Dr. Jones knows his uh, statistics very well, uh, particularly the counselor ratio. We have a very, very generous counselor ratio at 300 to 1. But that is not at all what uh, the American uh, Counseling Association, uh, American Society of Counselors, uh, 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 recommends, uh, which is closer to 200 or 250 to 1. That's a huge difference, especially in a large school like Thomas Dale. Um, you mentioned in the, um, the, dis the district improvement that you're um, targeting differentiating support, um, th that there are some measures. You're going to use some measures to determine what support is needed, where a school that might need math help or a school that might need this. So what measures are you going to use? Um, what I mean, assessments or how are we going to determine what staffing areas and where there's growth opportunities in a school community. Yeah, so some of those uh, data points that we, and I'd refer back to our presentation, we've already actually already switched over the slide deck, but that's not a, not a big deal. Um, we, we would look at some of uh, the end of year, uh, as much as we don't like looking at SOL data, looking at a couple of pieces of SOL data is pretty useful. Uh, using growth data, uh, particularly at the elementary and middle school level in uh, English language arts and mathematics is really important. 
uh, recognizing whether or not we are above or below the mean, if a school lands above or below the mean, is a pretty good indicator of how well they're performing relative to their peer schools. You could be performing just below the mean and be doing great, but you're still performing below the mean and we want to raise that level of performance. So we're going to, we look at, at really 10 factors uh, at the prima facie value of at or above the mean, and we listed those out. Um, the performance factors, the environmental factors, and the risk factors. And then uh, if we have schools that land on the cusp, we look at some secondary factors like what's the employee turnover at that school? How frequently are they able to get substitute fill rate? Things like that that do have an impact on um, where we target those resources. So again, you know, it may be not just giving an extra position to a school, but but having very intentional purpose of what that extra position is and what the data says that you should probably use that position for. Thanks, and I'm, I only have just a few, I swear, just a few more. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll combine these two. Basically, how will this, I wanna know how this is gonna be implemented to improve the outcomes for our students who receive special education services, as well as what kind of uh, how, are, how is this going to work for improving our graduation outcomes for our Hispanic Latinx community that we've already um, uh, identified as needing um, some support in, in graduation numbers? Well, this is going to have a, a more significant impact on um, our level one special education students who are accessing the general curriculum probably more than our level two students because we've already uh, established a ratio of six to one in our level two classes, uh, that, that's probably our tightest ratio of any group of students in, uh, in the county for any level of service. It's the right thing to do. We provide additional aids to support those classrooms. So our students who are accessing the general curriculum, uh, in, a, in, a, in the aggregate, I'm not sure that there is much per se that we could say that we would recognize as a measurable impact. However, at an individual school and in an individual classroom, where we are adding additional resources, our expectations are very high. Our expectations are that we seek that performance that we're looking for. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Jones probably pointed this out best, is uh, that they've been able to uh, achieve remarkable results at Thomas Dale in terms of graduation rate and dropout rate uh, without having a graduation coach, which is not a new concept to have a graduation coach. And a graduation coach is, is become commonplace in school districts that are of similar size to Chesterfield. However, a graduation coach at, in Chesterfield um, would run us near a million dollars to outfit all of our uh, high schools and to provide them the resources necessary to help get our kids over the line. Well, they're performing great at Thomas Dale, but there's still a margin of students who are not performing great. And it's like, how do we, or how might we create the conditions where that group of kids that are marginally performing meet expectations and perform better and are either enrolled, employed, or enlisted by the time they graduate. My last ask is I would love to see you know, at some point in the future uh, differentiated funding presented in the larger context of the student activity fee revenue and PTA funding. And I would love to see how that would, <laughs> I, would I, I wanna see that uh, equity uh, displayed. <laughs> this, is, this right. is where we do the snaps. Um, right. Yeah. Um, that, that was something I was trying to figure out how I'd get the public to hear this fact. And it's a fact I've said multiple times, but I think it's, it's, it bears repeating as often as um, we can say it. And that you actually said something that was incorrect, Dr. Taylor, because you said every student gets the same stuff. When, you, when they get $54 ahead for, in their student allocation. And they don't get the same stuff because we have very active PTAs in this community. And the PTA fundraisers support the school that that, fun, that fundraiser was, was they're designed to support, and naturally so. But when I heard, not this past spring, but the spring before, that there was a school's PTA in Chesterfield County that raised $400,000 for that school, 
And then another school in Chesterfield County the same year raised $400 in their PTA fundraiser. You will never convince me that the children in both those two schools had equitable experiences. They had vast different amounts of resources in the one where the PTA raised $400,000. And I know this because as a cheerleading coach and, people, and someone who worked in the schools, I would often go to the PTA because the principal did not have any more money to give me. And so we would go to the PTA and say, can you buy me popcorn? Because I had a popcorn machine. <laughs> and they would buy me popcorn for my you know, activities and things after school. And I would go to the PTA and say, the cheerleaders really need new uniforms, but the school doesn't have enough funds left to buy them. And our poor little cheerleaders would go off to the other end of the county and see all the brand new equipment and all the brand new uniforms and things because their PTA raised those funds. So there isn't, they're not getting the same stuff. And this differentiating funding would help level that playing field a little bit. Yeah, Chris Jones is back there. Stop it. Level that playing field for those schools. And it's, it's, just, it's just important to me. This is, this is my top Staffing, I mean, uh, funding for teacher decompression and this. These are it. I don't care if everything else gets cut. <laughs> we need to keep this. It has to stay. And Dr. Jones said it best, too. Put the money in the hands of the teachers, the students, and in the, the schools. That's where the money needs to go. Put the money there. They know how to spend it. They know what to do with it. Sorry, my soapbox. Okay. But, yes, that, uh, we're, that we're is a huge issue for me. agreement, and you're absolutely right. Uh, you as a school district and a school board, you give them the same allocation, but you're absolutely right. Our, our communities are very different. We love our community partners and, uh, and the folks that support our schools, but not all of our schools get the same support. And this is an iterative baby step in the right direction. And, and we're, we're glad that you're so enthusiastic about this because this is a meaningful part of the superintendent's uh, proposed budget. Thank you. Ms. Haynes, do you have something else to add? Um, yeah, I had... Uh, Two questions for uh, Thomas. What really is one left because the PTA was one of my um, things, and it's because I just did lunch duty in five schools, and it was very obvious which schools had spreads um, that were donated by the PTA, full lunches, um, goodies, and which schools had candy that was purchased by staff. Um, and it, I just... This was a hard week return. Everyone did a heavy lift, and to have some staff rewarded by f feast and the other, um, it, it was really hard for me to see. So, um, but my question is, um, to, and so I, I agree, decompression, differentiated funding, differentiated staffing. We can't cut those this year. Um, so the question is, um, the world you mentioned world languages um, as a secondary factor. And I'm wondering why you don't include um, other more rigorous courses that we know are connected to uh, college access. Uh, greatest correlation between <laughs> performance. Um, it's just one indicator of many. It's an example. So, but it has a great, it has a strong correlation between performance and outcomes. So, it's a good question. It, it, um, thank you for asking that. Ms. Coker? Sorry, I just have one question because I know I'm, I'm looking at the time. Um, so in our tiers, uh, tier three, two, and one, um, as you fund or, or provide that staffing and someone moves out of tier three into tier two and so forth, do you make adjustments for the staffing or is that staffing set? Uh, it's one year to make it into a higher tier. It's uh, two to three years to make it out of one. Um, so, uh, Dr. Smith talked about this a little bit. Uh, it would make no sense whatsoever to say, congratulations on your national Title I distinguished school status. We're going to yank everything tomorrow. Uh, but slowly, we have been reallocating the resources uh, from that school and, and, uh, and, and applying them to other schools that uh, do need them. And um, I think our principals are all pragmatists and recognize that they're not the only school in the district. But they're also advocates, and uh, rightfully, uh, they, uh, they have a, the best handle, better than we ever could understand, of the needs of their schools. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a great boon uh, that Ettrick has continued to be as successful as it is, but it's a Tier 2 school still. And the reason it's a Tier 2 school and not a Tier 1 school is because 
We don't think uh, that we can pull all of the resources uh, right away, but we have reduced it. It's no longer a tier three school. So it, it is an iterative uh, process over time and not automatic. But when you need the help, you need the help now, not uh, two years later. Um, but we don't want uh, the support network that gets you to success uh, for that security blanket to be pulled out from underneath you all at one time in one moment. We don't think that that's right. All right, thank you, Dr. Taylor. Uh, next up, we have a presentation on departmental budget requests. I'm delighted to be uh, back up uh, to uh, MC what I like to call the Parade of Chiefs, um, where you will get to see our organizational system on display um, as a school division or a school system. Uh, we are divided into functional divisions and uh, within those divisions, departments, and within those departments, offices. And so you'll hear from each division chief some of the requests that have uh, landed in the superintendent's proposed budget and have an opportunity for the board to go into depth um, and ask questions about individual budget items and to hear some of the nuanced uh, pieces of their request. Each chief will talk a little bit about some of the uh, um, non-discretionary items that landed in their budget within their domain, and then go into the detail of some of the requests that are in the fiscal 22 ask in the superintendent's proposed budget. And then if time permits, talk a little bit about some of the things that are in the outlying years of your five-year plan. So we'll begin. Uh, where things matter most in the classroom with uh, the Division of Teaching and Learning uh, with Dr. Sharon Pope. Good evening, Board Chair, Vice Chair, members, Dr. Darty. Um, thank you for all you do. We appreciate you, and it must be very difficult to hear all of the needs that are presented to you throughout these budget sessions. We know your hearts, and we know that you would give every single need and fill it if you could. Um, but I will jump in and share with you on behalf of the Division of Teaching and Learning our top budget priorities, uh, many of which are in the superintendent's budget, and we're grateful for that. Very first slide just lists our two non-discretionary items that we have in the Division of Teaching and Learning budget. The first is the Child Children's Service Act, which is a contribution to the state-supported services for eligible youth and families. And the second item listed there is our ongoing commitment to our regional governor schools and code RVA. So you see the amounts. And very quickly, then we will move into discretionary items. And the very first one that I'd like to present to you is a gesture, just a gesture of support for elementary literacy. We put this request forward every year, and we understand that there are different needs and you have to make decisions, but I assure you the, the need remains constant in this area. As long as I am chief academic officer, this will remain at the top of my list because I feel that strongly that we need to ensure that pre-K through five literacy resources are available to all schools. These resources must be engaging, aligned to the science of reading principles, also um, balanced literacy, and they need to meet the standards for cultural responsiveness that we are now using as we review all of our resources for our students. I'm not sure if you're aware, but we have not adopted district-wide literacy resources for elementary schools since the 2008 Treasures series. And currently, all schools, including our new schools, must cobble together funding from PTAs and their own limited annual funds. Without division-wide provided elementary literacy resources, we increase in equity and we lack a comprehensive programmatic literacy foundation. This request will merely get us started. This $2,400 investment per school at the elementary level will simply buy one set of decodable texts per school at the kindergarten and first grade levels. Teachers will have to share. This item is, in my opinion, 
the very best investment to ensure independent, strategic, and excited young readers who are prepared with the foundation needed to ensure their success through graduation day. And I thank you for allowing me so much time on that item. It is a passion point for me. I will go a little quicker on the rest because I'm watching the clock for you. The next item is digital curriculum funding. And this request simply reestablishes one quarter of the previously approved funding, which was a $200,000 increase that was slated to occur annually and approved by the school board in 2014. That uh, annual increase of $200,000 was halted in 2018-19. And very simply, if you don't know the history, we shifted over a decade ago from purchasing and adopting paper textbooks to a digital curriculum. At that time, we were a leading district who received U.S. Department of Education and international recognition for our forward thinking. We have heavily invested in student devices, a learning management system, and a delivery network. Um, that was before we knew about COVID, so thankfully we did have that structure in place. Today, these investments are no longer forward thinking. Today, we are simply aligned to the Virginia Department of Education and really the world all around us. As a district, we have not invested in textbooks for the last 12 to 18 years, depending on the subject area. And even more than a decade ago, a single textbook adoption cost us in the past between $300,000 and $2.5 million. Digital curriculum, we believe, is better. It's not only the way of the future, but it comes to life when compared to the flat page of a textbook. It remains current. It provides interactive experiences that grab all learner types. It's searchable, and it fits how today and tomorrow's students arrive fluent and familiar with receiving information in this way. While we have made significant progress in the past seven years in building a digital curriculum, we still do have content areas with unmet need for digital curriculum and resources. While we can pursue the next round of COVID relief funding to continue uh, purchasing the learning apps that we bought under emergency status this summer, we must at some point resume annual increased investments in furthering the build out of our digital curriculum and to continue our annual subscriptions. And I know Ms. Bailey, at one of the previous meetings you asked to be made aware of what could be funded. That's why that little red box is up there. Okay. On the next slide, I think this is one that will require a much shorter explanation. We are aware of PSAT for all in Chesterfield County Public Schools. It's something we're very proud of. Um, just as a reminder for those listening, PSAT for all in eighth and ninth grade is free in Chesterfield County. It provides an added growth measure for us and it's also an identifier of student gap areas to be addressed during the student's final years with us. Any student leveraging their results information can better meet college and career readiness goals and access higher level coursework such as AP and dual enrollment. Approval of this request will ensure the continuation of something we're all very proud of, but up to this point has been funded through an external partner. There's your red tag again, Ms. Bailey, <laughs> for the next item. Um, this item, virtual access software solutions, actually will benefit 2,500 students across 23 CTE programs and five visual arts courses across middle and high schools. It will allow these students in these programs and levels I've described to have access to necessary courseware virtually. Currently, these students are very hampered in their access. They either have to access the software required for their very unique courses when they're in a classroom, face-to-face -face with the computer in the classroom, or 
after school in scheduled lab times with teachers in a face-to-face -face situation. As you can imagine, our virtual situation has made this far more difficult for our students, and right now they cannot equitably access the software that they need to complete their projects. They have to actually take turns because we have very limited licensing and we have um, Chromebooks that really can't run this type of programming. We can pursue uh, some of this funding offset through a COVID relief funding, but a permanent IT solution is necessary for continued equitable access and opportunity for these students and the classes they're in. Next item is a recurring cost. Uh, this would extend our coordinators of special education for 46 CSEs from 10 months to 11 months in their contract. What might happen during this extra month, you ask? Well, we can better support student enrollments, eligibility, and IEP meetings. We can provide critical professional development, something that we just can't do right now. And if you know anything about special education, you always need to be up to date on your understanding in that area. We can better ensure timely delivery of services and a general smoother start to the school year for staff and students. And I think this one's very important as well. We need to be able to ensure our special education teachers and case managers have the same opportunity as our general education colleagues in that the teacher return week should be a time when they can focus on preparing their classrooms and their lessons to welcome their students. Right now, that week is often spent catching up from the things they weren't there to do the previous month. This benefit will positively impact our 7,500 plus special education students with IEPs and 504s, their family, and the staff who serve them. Next item, very innovative and exciting. Uh, definitely wanted to put it on your radar as a possibility. Um, and this would really extend the way we support our new teachers that we welcome into Chesterfield County Public Schools. We estimate 260 new teachers in 21-22. The estimated cost here is being cited at $2,000 per teacher. It is a base estimate uh, using preliminary vendor pricing um, but of course, if this was approved, it would go out on competitive bid. And the idea here is that a new teacher support network uh, would significantly increase beyond what we already provide to our new teachers. Currently, our model does meet VDOE compliance, but what we do is we have one CCPS new teacher support specialist to serve all of our schools. We have a two-day PD kickoff, a pre teacher return week for our new hires, and we have an assigned school mentor. Very often that assigned school mentor may not be someone who teaches in the same subject area or the same grade level. As you know, many of you who taught in schools, there are sometimes those single teachers in your building that nobody else in that building teaches band, for example. Um, this network will allow them a coach and a mentor that's dialed up and ready to support them throughout the year and can actually be someone who's not part of their evaluation process, someone who um, can just really teach them and mentor them through that first year and the struggles, and they can be really honest and open with them. And this person on the network end will have plenty of time for them. And sometimes the mentors in a building, of course, struggle with that. My final slide for items that we would love you to consider, um, this actually, is should funding become available. Um, some of the things that we submitted, um, the first one is the continuation of something we began this year because of COVID, and that was the expansion of the NWEA MAPS test to the second, ninth, and 10th grades. This is our primary growth measure as it gives us comparable and longitudinal data on individual student performance. It shows us school performance, shows us district performance. We can look at that with national trends. Um, and it is something that we can pursue the next round of COVID relief funding to continue in 21-22. So that would have a little red tag if I could have squeezed it on the slide. 
The next item on this final slide is an assessment specialist, and I have to pause long enough just to tell you a little story on this one. Our assessment office at the district level um, has been staffed since 1998 with one specialist position and one clerical support. I think we would all agree that since 1998, when SOLs were the primary focus of this office, we've added a lot of mandated tests as well as district tests that we've chosen to give because we see value in them. Currently, we have about 300,000 unique testing occurrences each year. This one specialist serves as the VDOE DDOT that every school division is required to have. Um, and that's just the district director of testing. And when you look at other districts our size, with the same number of annual testing occurrences, we would see a staff of three to five people. So they've just been holding on for a very long time with a very limited staff. The next request on this slide um, is definitely something that we want to put on your radar, but we do already have secured this coming year's funding for the work-based learning coordinator position. That grant funding will end, and we will need, if we want to continue this, funding for FY23. In case, for any reason you're not aware, I'll just say it again. To meet our Imagine Tomorrow 2025 goal, um, the College Career and Civic Index for Readiness, which is a required measurement for student school quality for accreditation, insists on work-based learning and service learning components. This position actually does all the groundwork of establishing those relationships with businesses and partners in the community and finding those opportunities to place our many, many high school students who will have to have this experience. And then the final item, as you, this board is well aware, we have expanded our uh, elementary school CBG programs. And um, this request is really to move one current specialist from grant funding to local funds so that we can ensure the continuation of that position and then add a specialist. By adding a specialist, that would restore us to 2018-19 staffing levels when we actually had fewer CBG sites and fewer gifted students. So I think that makes sense when you think of it that way. Okay, any questions? Um, your first slide, uh, adding the, um, the books to expand uh, science of reading. I, I heard you mentioned uh, balanced literacy, um, which I heard is sort of an anathema um, to those uh, advocating for science of reading. And I, I'm assuming that's because we have, don't have the resources yet as a district to shift to a fully implementing the science of reading approach. And I would love to here, because um, I'm sure you thought about it, sort of what that cost would be, um, how do we get there? So I think a good comparison would be to look back at our request last year. And we actually, as I said, we request this in a variety of ways each year, just hoping for funding. Um, last year we asked for $356,000. And that was to provide about 9,500 for kindergarten, first and second grade. So if you think about that for all of our schools, 350K, let's say for three grade levels, um, I would say that to really get us a comprehensive literacy approach, we would need about $500,000 to really get us on point. This is a $93,000 request, which as I said, is a gesture towards. Um, but when we think about science of reading principles, we know that that's very heavily phonics driven. We do have folks out there and we do have resources currently in our building that are very whole language driven. We have sight words, you know, et cetera, that we'll see as you walk through school buildings, you'll see the sight words on the walls, for example, in the hallway. We really wanna have a comprehensive approach because we do believe it's a blending of the two, but we absolutely know that we are shy right now with science of reading and that we really need to give teachers the resources to be able to cover that phonics instruction the way we want to. Thanks, and then my only other question um, is the PSAT, SAT 
Uh, I mentioned this before, but new information is that UVA um, just announced that they're extending their um, test optional admissions policy and other universities are supposed to follow suit. So in a tight budget year, I wonder if that's something that maybe we could have uh, other donors fund again um, that's not a critical need this year. That's a good I wonder. <laughs> what to say. Other questions? Go ahead, Ms. Yes. Um So in the new teacher support network, um, have we done anything or made any efforts to um, generate something like this homegrown um, to have some countywide networking, professional networking opportunities across schools, across grade levels, across content areas? We are taking a PLC approach, and the, um, the new specialist that's uh, absolutely focused on new teacher support that is one of the things that we're working on. How do you form those PLCs across the division and network? Um, I will say that a benefit of COVID is that we've had to do so much virtually that we have seen how it works and how it can work better. And we do now fortunately have a person in that position to fully develop out all of those possibilities. So we're very thankful for that position. Thank you, Dr. Pope. Yes. Okay. And I believe Dr. Lisa High is up right after me. Clicker's right there. Good afternoon. Happy School Board Appreciation Month. Um, we appreciate all the hard work that you do each and every month to work for our schools and to support our schools. Um, I will move straight into the Division of School Leadership um, information. To start, we'll talk about non-discretionary um, expenditures. As we open Mosley Elementary in the fall of 2022, it will be necessary to have staff in place to continue with the planning and execution of the critical tasks that it takes to open a new school. Um, this staffing fund funding allocation is for $205,000. Um, and we know that um, currently we're advertising for a principal for Mosley Elementary in order to get us started um, as of July, July 1. That's our, that's our goal. The three additional non-discretionary items are nurses, counselors, and ESL teachers. With those expenditures, um, we were able to utilize CARES funding in FY21 um, to secure those positions. Um, knowing that in order to move forward, we needed to allocate additional fundings for those expenditures. Um, it has a red um, mark because we're hoping that we can potentially use some of the ESSER um, available funding to fund this in FY22. There will be 10 um, expenditures or recommendations that I will be putting forward today in this presentation. Six of the budget enhancements did come through the presentation on January 26, the additional five, um, four are ones that we're, we understand that may be in additional budget years um, further out. So to start with translation, um, our focus is on the services and to enhance communication. Currently, our budget for translation and interpretation is $20,000. Um, this budgeted amount has been this amount for over 15 years, for a very long time. Um, as of October of um, this year, we had spent 76% of that budget in just a couple of months. So we're asking for there to be an increase of 80,000 for a total of $100,000. Our English language learner population has increased um, to be 14%, which is 84 students. So that's 8,400 students that, um, and families that we would like to support using these funds. Um, we would be very intentional and strategic as we plan for the communication in our families to communicate with families in their home language. As Dr. Jones shared earlier, we do have Language Line, which our school-based staff and our central office staff utilize to communicate and have two-way communication with our families. This program allows us to interpret the conversations, and we believe that this will allow a more collaborative relationship with our families. Student email. This was a board request. Um, currently, students have email addresses, but do not, they don't function as email accounts. If high school students are provided functional email accounts, it would be beneficial to expand the Google services to monitor the student 
email accounts. Gaggle would be the way that we would monitor that. And Gaggle allows us to receive alerts if there's any questionable content or a potential threat um, to our students um, on, through their account. This aligns with what we believe in Maslow before Blooms. This will give us a little bit more insight into the well-being of our students. So the next four items are staffing and their multi-year request. We'll begin with the technology support analyst. The annual cost for one position is $101,875. We're requesting that we add a minimum of one per year for the next five years. The standards of quality require that a school division employs technical support staff at a one staff member per 1,000 students. Funding of this request contributes to the meeting of that standard as well as supporting the needs of our student populations and the needs of our teachers in a more timely and efficient manner. Currently, our TSA serve three schools. Staffing at this level has resulted in some delays in providing student and teacher technical support. Um, it's been over 20 years since we have added any um, technical support. So we've added 60,000 plus Chromebooks. We've added lots of different instructional programming that our technical support um, department utilizes and makes sure that it runs um, efficiently on a daily basis. So not having that increase, we're asking for at least one, minimum of one for the next five years. Moving into the elementary level, general education instructional assistance. I think we can all agree that a strong elementary education is an indicator for student success. Having strong teachers are essential to that student's success, but our general instructional assistance position provides support um, to include working with our students in small groups, supporting the teacher in preparing materials, as well as classroom assistance. Prior to 2008, every elementary school was staffed with five instructional assistants. During the economic crisis, two of those positions were eliminated per school. This, the request for this year is to add two instructional assistants for the FY22 budget and then to propose to add one per school for the next three years to get us back to a level of six instructional assistants. School-based annual substitutes. This comes up every year from our principals, wanting a permanent substitute. They really believe that this will allow for there to be a greater continuity of the functional management of schools. Having a dedicated permanent substitute supports the schools in covering half days, partial days, when there's a meeting that needs to be covered and it's, it's been difficult to find someone to cover that class and you're having to pull a teacher on their planning period. So having this permanent sub will allow for, um, for that to be negated in some way. Um, this substitute would also become a part of the school community and be an integral member of that community, having a deeper understanding of the climate and culture of the school. Stipends, and this is really a recruitment and retention strategy. Um, this request is to add additional stipends for our coaches, as well as our dual enrollment and early college academy instructors. Um, these are, for the instructors, it's additional responsibilities that our instructors have as a result of some of the things that they have to do with um, John Tyler um, College. So there are four additional requests that are not included in this budget and we hope that will be considered in future budgets. The additional, first one is additional clerical support at the elementary schools. This would be moving 11 month secretaries to 12 month secretaries and moving 10 month to 11 month secretaries. This extension will help with the registration of students and other critical tasks that are needed to take place during the summer. Elementary, again, um, we would like to request that the, oops, sorry, I forgot, I had all of them on one slide. Um, the, the second is for us to extend the contracts of 34 of our elementary assistant principals from 11-month contracts to 12-month contracts. With this, it will allow those administrators who are really, we see as building our pipeline to be principals, this would allow them to be more engaged in the interviewing process and the hiring process. 
take um, advantage of the professional development opportunities that we are able to offer during the summer, um, as well as when our principals are out and summer schools going on or there are tasks that are happening in the schools, having them as 12-month employees would support um, with the functions at school. And then the next one is summer extended for enrichment as well as virtual option. Um, the extended enrichment is really for our Title I schools um, who some students were not able to take advantage of enrichment camps because of either lack of finances or the timing of when the camp was being offered. So we were looking to potentially extend the day to be able to provide that um, benefit to, to some of our students. The virtual option, we did it last year. We had over 13,000 um, students participate and we do believe that this is an um, option that we would be looking at forward, which also aligns with the summer school elimination of tuition fees. Um, prior to last year, if a student um, engaged in a summer class, they took, they paid for it. Elementary was around $180. Um, middle school was 224 and our high school was 250 um, Again, by having, eliminating these fees, it will provide more opportunities for students to, to take them. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. High. Board members, questions? Those last two on that last slide, couldn't they be, ESSER funds be used for those? Yeah, yeah the, the last two, the summer school one and the, yes, the extended day. Both of those possible ESSER funds? Yes. Mm -hmm. Just checking. Yes. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I just have a quick, oh, I just have a quick question. Why um, is there a 5% increase for um, VHSL supplements and dual enrollment? Um, are those not included in typical annual salary increases? I'll answer that just very briefly. Actually, we were able to collapse several unused supplements, so it's actually an increase is is greater than the $50,000, but by collapsing some of those, we did realize a savings. It has been forever since our coaches and uh, those who've received academic supplements have received any kind of remunerated increase, and so that's what's reflective of that, and it's about a 5%. Uh, so that increase. is not looped in on the annual salary increases? No, it's not. Okay, it's thank not. you. So yeah, this that's... is a, an ad. Great, thank you. Um, one question on the technology support analyst. Um, just wondering if that would be part of CARES as well, given that it's a technology need. I know that would be something that we'd have to fund future, but at least for this upcoming year. I think it is something that we can look into to make sure that that falls within the guidelines. Okay. Thank you. Um, piggybacking off... Uh, Ms. Saffron's question, um, will that increase then increase our pool of dual enrollment uh, teachers? I know James River parents still feel the sting of. It's, it's not an increase for that. It's really a stipend um, for the additional responsibilities. Um, what we're looking at is at a $500 um, per semester. Do you think that, that will encourage more people to obtain and, and teach the certification and teach dual enrollment classes? We, we hope that that incentive May, may help with that, um, but it really is for the additional responsibilities that they that they have right now. Okay. I'm hoping to increase our pool. That'd be great. Thank you. And I, I think it's just important for all of us to, to note that everything that we put an ESSER tag on on here eventually needs to land in the budget. Definitely. If it's something that, you know, um, that, that is something that is a bit concerning for me because there is a lot of Basically, we're robbing from Peter to pay Paul today, but eventually we're going to have to come up with some of this money if we want to keep these things in our operating budget. So um, it is great to have the ESSER money to help fund things short term, but I think everyone does need to realize that if we are going to make these positions sustainable, um, the nurses as an example, uh, we, we do need to eventually look at a place where we can land these in the budget because eventually we're not going to have ESSER money. Um, so I think that is something to just keep in mind. But thank you, Dr. Hyde, for coming up and talking about that. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Doherty. I've been asked to pick up the tempo, so I'll try to uh, move through this. Uh, I don't have any popcorn, but I've got some things that I consider to be meat and potatoes in the division of operations that I'd like to share with you. 
Uh, I think you've seen these non-discretionary items, so uh, I won't belabor any of them. That's about $3 million worth of things that we absolutely have to do and I think have been good choices. Um, major maintenance, there's been a proposal to add another half a million to uh, our pay-as-you-go portion of that. It's about $9 million right now. You know that the county's uh, granted us uh, some generous bonds to help us get through the next few years also. Uh, certainly fully support this as we, as we step forward. Uh, what a, we're, this is where I want to kind of put a stake in the ground, these next two. Uh, our people are still our most important aspect of our jobs, whether it's uh, in operations or in the classroom. Uh, Scott Carson, great hire for the Department of Construction. There are 17 people on his staff, nine of whom are contractors for MBP. Most of that MBP staff focuses on their new construction buildings, but two of them are solely dedicated right now to major maintenance projects. But when you look at his contract administrator or admin assistant, he's only got five CCPS project managers in, in that staff. And uh, I think in the long run, we would seek to insource perhaps those two MVP slots for the positions that you see here. Um, the, the first year price tag is actually a little smaller because a uh, little translation, actually what we want is an engineer and a senior project manager the first two year, that first year. And hopefully we can maybe accelerate some of those other positions uh, in the future. But again, his workload with the major maintenance has, has almost tripled. And I could bring up here a lot of facts and recite them to you, but uh, we really need this work to be done correct. And the contractors don't always get it right. You know, we've got three jobs recently that I could recite to you where our PM has been the key person to make sure that it gets right. It takes a lot of time and effort. So again, stake in the ground for this one in particular. And uh, I, uh, the, the MVP folks are being paid out of that major maintenance pay as you go money. So maybe some of those trade-offs will be possible. And in the future, this would almost be cost neutral. But uh, we do want to begin this migration. Uh, my second stake in the ground is to support special education transportation. Area 5 is the most challenging uh, of our zones. The special education children go to school year-round, even five days a week in the summer. We've got a great manager there. Pam Jeffer does a fantastic job. She's burning the candle at both ends. And we really think that adding an assistant manager in Area 5 w w would really help. And uh, I'll just put those two initiatives as my top two and, and move on to a few others. PPE, obviously we're continuing to spend money in this fiscal year. This is a placeholder. Uh, again, ESSER potential. Uh, continuing with the theme of, of working with our people. This is an equity thing. Uh, the county has had a career development program and an apprentice program for their HVAC technicians for a, a lengthy period of time. And we really need to, uh, to be able to bring in bright young people, train them for four years, give them some step increases along the way, so there's a dedicated training program that John Thuma has outlined, and then uh, per, uh, some initiatives in regards to better pay at the mid-level once they reach the journeyman status. Our folks are really, really underpaid when it's compared to the private sector and the money that they could work working for Colonial Web as opposed to working for us. So uh, this one's an important one too, not, not a huge price tag on it, but uh, it's something I think that would just really be good. Um, Student transportation coordinators, uh, we're going to do a lot of summer school in the next few years. Uh, we, we've got some catching up to do. We're moving to more year-round schools. Um, just as some of the notes that were made uh, in regards to some of our educational staff and buildings, this is, uh, again, a, a fairly inexpensive uh, initiative just to move some folks to 12 months. And I'll, I'll share with you that in the other localities where I've worked with, the folks doing this job have, have also worked throughout the summer and uh, would, would be, a, 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 again, an appreciable uh, addition for Calvin staff. All right. Wow. Here's something you guys really helped us last year, and, and so did the county. We finally got preventive maintenance underway. That was a really big step on the ladder. We want to take a couple more steps. And uh, again, you see some big numbers there. We see ESSER is possibly helping us move beyond HVAC and roofing, where we've seen some real success, onto electrical, plumbing, and structural systems. So I think you guys understand how. Uh, Productive that that, re, that investment has been in the past, and again, a couple more steps would be very, very useful. Custodial positions. Uh, this one's a, it's 31 jobs, and uh, we, we we could put them in, if we could hire them and, and use them next year, it, it would really be a shot in the arm. We've proposed to spread this out as so, several other initiatives had. Our middle schools they have two day porters, the same as an elementary school. The high schools have four. The square footage of those buildings. 
just out at Bailey Bridge talking to, to Melanie and Joe, the, the BOS out there. They're real concerned about two people managing the cafeteria here as these students are coming back. And it's more than just a COVID issue. So if we can begin to make some strides for middle schools and with our custodial floaters, that floater team is great. And they are going around and taking care of uh, cleaning behind areas where uh, right now where uh, folks perhaps are, are catching COVID and we're just wanting to sanitize real quickly. But their normal job is to support us at central office and then take care of absences. So they've got seven people to take care of the absences of 153 folks. And unfortunately, that's not enough. And uh, again, just uh, spreading out over four years, we, we hope, uh, I'm going to show you three big ones here in a row. And this one, I think, is the most important. So here's the second of the three. Again, some big numbers to enhance our maintenance staffing. When we look at what's considered to be the APA standards that are prescribed by that organization, we need more people doing these jobs. Okay, we also acknowledge that we are contracting some of it out. So uh, when John Thuma put this together, he left the last 20 or so positions, understanding that the, hopefully our PM contracts will take care of this. But we do need to continue to build the staff and, and, the, and the equipment that works with them. Uh, another possible rest, uh, ESSER problem, uh, we, we want a retro commission, and that's kind of an interesting term. We want to make sure that these HVAC systems continue to operate as they were initially designed. So the initial commissioning would be for our new buildings just to verify, okay, you designed it and it's performing. Retro means we're going to go back and look at systems as we're repairing them, uh, as we're maintaining them, and to do some additional exercises to ensure that they do meet the standards of their design. So this is a good, important one also. Um, hope Esther can do it. I see this replacement warehouse. It's not a big, big one. I think the actual number is now 42,000. County's going to pay for the modifications. It's, it's almost uh, non-negotiable because if you've ever been to the Fulgham Center, um, that, that's what we're trying to get out of. It's an old church that's dilapidated. Uh, uh, that's the point of no return there. So this is a nice hangar that's been identified over uh, at the airport, and, and we really need this space, not only in a COVID environment but beyond, uh, when we have lots of things that we need to store, and usually in a temporary manner. So I think this might be my last one, painting and floor replacement. Uh, so I went to Meadowbrook High, saw that beautiful gym floor, and it was pointed out to me, look at the drab walls. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and we just haven't had, this is something else that's fallen by the wayside, our, our, the, our floors and the painting jobs and uh, understanding that dollars are going to be tight. You're going to have to make some tough decisions. So this one's a little lower down the priority list, but I, I think it's important in our buildings in the long run that we eventually get this started. Okay, any questions before I turn it over to Mr. Meister? Board members, any questions? Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Ann. I see that light line. <laughs> um, regarding the custodial increase, can you explain um, exactly how that, that came to be? Um, just the $2 million, that's a big price tag. I think we Sure, some... the non-negotiable one. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. we, we have not, in recent selections, we have not chosen the cheapest vendor. And um, we have seen that the vendor that we've chosen in some of these has been very successful. Uh, Dr. Jones uh, explained to Mr. Harder how well that things were going at his school. So we've consciously made the decision to not always go with the lowest price. And uh, that's a big number. And mm -hmm. it's uh, not quite as big as insourcing as we've discussed with Ms. Heffron in the past. So uh, uh, it, it's, it's choosing the right organization for the right school. And so uh, we, we've had some that have failed, and, and that's been a tough part of the job in the last 12 months is to say to goodbye a couple of these companies. They won the contract due to their low bids, and we got what we paid for. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Meister. Uh, thank you again for the time to talk to you today. It wouldn't have been a budget presentation if I didn't at least get two minutes, but I will be relatively quick here because I know you guys are running out of time. Uh, you've heard me talk about the non-discretionary items on this page before. I won't dwell on them. The big ones on here are obviously the health care increase, which we're assuming 5%, and the debt service increase as provided by the county, really to help pay for the mortgage, if you will, on our existing uh, debt service that we see out there. Uh, we can talk more about those later. The other two things that I do want to talk to you a little bit about are the initiatives for me wearing an operational hat. Uh, as you guys all know, our 
the vision is a growing one. It's been growing for a number of years, and the complexity and the nuance of that organization has also increased. If you look back, our budget staff has actually decreased. Seven years ago, there were nine. Now there are seven. This would be part one of a several year, two or three year phase to bring that budget team back up to where it needs to be. What we're requesting this year is two members of the staff to increase that team from seven to nine, which is the staffing level it was several years ago and starts to move us closer to a place where we can continue to manage the budget in a meaningful way, but also create some extra value add in terms of meaningful analysis and quite frankly, allowing the team to go home at a reasonable hour. The other item on the uh, page here is our payroll system. Uh, this is an area where the county does a great job of supporting us, but they're supporting us with a system, quite frankly, that is not built to support the nuances and what a school system really does. Uh, the price tag here is large, a million and a half uh, implementation, 1.2 million ongoing, but what this would do is really address several different problems within the district. We have several audit concerns. We have accuracy issues with our payroll. Uh, we are relatively inefficient as well. We're still passing paper as an example back and forth to do payroll. This would really modernize us and bring us into, I'll say at least the 1990s. Uh, we'll shoot to get into the 2020s with this as well. Uh, and this is one of those items, well, it looks like a big price tag here. It's something that will definitely pay for itself over the longer term in terms of just accuracy and then punch inflation and just being able to understand and analyze the biggest 70% of our budget is come, comes out of payroll, and this would be a means to better understand that. So I will pause for questions there. I ran through that relatively quickly, but thoughts, questions, I would be happy to take. I think we've already been asking questions of you on multiple levels <laughs> for the last couple we weeks over this budget. So thank you, Mr. Meister. Thank you. All right, and I'm going to close out with just the last couple things. Um, as you can see, uh, my list of non-discretionary items is extensive. Uh, we do need to support uh, ADA in our human resources and benefits offices uh, to make sure that we are adequately covering for that. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have probably never heard of HRIS, or Human Resources Information Systems, but this has been uh, a part of our Human Resources and Talent Management Office that we have focused on this past year to automate and to bring us up to the 21st century. I'm not saying where in the 21st century, but to, up to the 21st century uh, in terms of what we are doing with our data collection and records as well as how we might be able to better leverage those records in a way that could actually save us money. Uh, the way that we do payroll, uh, the way that we collect resignations uh, is a revolving door. And we need to make sure that we are adequately uh, tracking that information uh, in our HRIS systems and uh, this critical audit function, analytics function, will, will perform a pretty critical role for us. Uh, something that has been on the county's radar for some time is uh, adding to our uh, residency techs in our student conduct and uh, constituent services office. Uh, these are folks that investigate uh, potential claims of uh, folks who do not necessarily live in Chesterfield County but may be taking advantage of Chesterfield County services. Uh, we do have that from time to time. We do have two presently on the staff. This was a, a request that actually started uh, from county administration uh, for us to look at. Uh, the next item is something that we supported uh, this past year through a safety and security grant. And uh, at some point, we'll need to come back into our operating budget if this is something that the board uh, wishes to continue. As a reminder, and something that we really haven't experienced with uh, the ins and outs of uh, uh, in-person and hybrid learning, but we know that uh, emergencies happen, and when emergencies happen, seconds count. And uh, making sure that our administrators and support staff have a, a rapid means of connecting to emergency services in the event of an emergency uh, is critically important. And uh, this has been a nice partnership that we've taken advantage of over the past year plus. Uh, we just hope that this is something that we can continue in the future. We do have a handful of other things that we would like to ask in outlying years, uh, beginning with uh, more support for our HRIS. As you can imagine, uh, as a school system that serves uh, 60,000 students and 8,000 plus full-time employees, not to mention uh, nearly 2,000 more 
additional employees that are part-time, the paperwork uh, uh, load is significant, and so is the data entry load. And if we plan on leveraging some of that data, we, we would definitely need the support to manage that in a more concrete way. Uh, something that we don't spend an awful lot of time talking about and is not super cheery to talk about is the important work that our employee relations specialists do. Occasionally, from time to time, uh, we have uh, folks that apply to Chesterfield County that may have a checkered past uh, that is uh, not within our policy bounds to employ, or uh, somebody who may have been engaged in conduct uh, that uh, uh, no longer meets policy. And uh, we need to have uh, trained uh, personnel that can investigate these events and uh, take appropriate action. Um, this is critically important as to the litigious nature of some of these issues. As you can tell, uh, this evening's event is televised through our Swagit app and is put uh, out through uh, various electronic means. But that's not the only thing that we do with television cameras. We have a number of events that go on in Chesterfield County that we're incredibly proud of. And we have a hardworking, dedicated team of folks working in our family and community uh, relations team that, that helps support that, uh, even folks that are here this evening running our TV crew behind us. Uh, we feel that there's even a potential cost savings here in overtime expense if we augment the staff and actually staff that according to appropriate ratios like we are aiming to do in budget, human resources, talent management, employee relations, and so forth and so on. Uh, we also have uh, security camera maintenance as a big part of uh, our future plans to make sure that the security cameras that we aim to put into our school buildings, that we're able to maintain them in the future. Uh, that wraps us up for the Parade of Chiefs. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. School board members, is there any discussion or announcements? Okay, the next school board business meeting will be held this evening, February 9th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. in the public hearing room on the superintendent's proposed fiscal year 2022 operating budget and fiscal year 2022 to 28 capital improvement plan. These will be held at the start of the meeting. If there's no further public business, we will enter into closed session. Due to social distancing best practices, the closed session will be held at CCPS Central Office Boardroom at Kraus Road. Mr. Clerk, please announce the items for today's closed session. It is my understanding that the school board desires to enter into a closed session in accordance with Section 2.2-3711.A of the Code of Virginia, the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and specifically under Subsection 1, the discussion and consideration of personnel disciplinary matters. Members of the board, you've just heard the items requested to be discussed at closed session. Do I have a motion in that regard? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Clerk, would you please call roll on the motion? Dot Heffron? Aye. Debbie Bailey? Aye. Catherine Haynes? Aye. Ann Coker? Aye. Ryan Harder? Aye. We are now in closed session. In an open session? So moved. Is there a second? Second. The board is now in open session. Mr. Clerk, would you please read the resolution certifying the closed session? Now, therefore, be it resolved that the school board hereby certifies that, to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification resolution applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the school board. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Clerk, would you please call roll on the motion? Dot Heffron? Aye. Debbie Bailey? Aye. Catherine Haynes? Aye. Ann Coker? Aye. Ryan Harder? Aye. The motion carries. Is there a motion regarding the first personnel matter? In case number 2020-21-18-HR, it is recommended that the superintendent's recommendation be upheld. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Clerk, would you please call roll on the motion? Dot Heffron? Aye. Debbie Bailey? Aye. Catherine Haynes? Aye. Ann Coker? Aye. Ryan Harder? Aye. The motion carries. Is there a motion regarding the next personnel matter? In case number 2020-21-19-HR, it is recommended that the superintendent's recommendation be upheld. Is there a second? Second. 
Mr. Clerk, would you please call roll on the motion? Dot Heffron? Aye. Debbie Bailey? Aye. Catherine Haynes? Aye. Ann Coker? Aye. Ryan Harder? Aye. The motion carries.